enjoy the tour that you see around you. All right, so that's that. Let's get started, shall we? Uh, so Chicago itself uh, was first, quote unquote, discovered by a couple of French explorers in the 1600s. Of course, at the time, the area was settled by Native Americans. Predominantly, it was three tribes, the Ojibwa, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi that created the council. Uh, they called it the, in this area. And the second word, Uwa, which loosely translates to river, for of course, the river. So, taken together, Chicago, or as the French would come to pronounce it, Chicago, roughly translates to river of the stinky wild onion, or yeah, all right, humble beginnings to be sure, or smelly onion land if you're more into the brevity thing. But essentially, we have kind of tried to shed those humble beginnings, and the result is what you are going to see in the next 75 minutes. This river is actually the reason why we have come up. Uh, two French explorers, Jacques Marquette and Louis Joliet, uh, just came upon this site. They had come all the way down from the upper peninsula of Lake Michigan. They were looking for a passageway to the Mississippi River, and what they found at the very tail end of the Chicago River was a little three-mile strip of land that separated the Chicago River from the Des Plaines River, which empties into the Mississippi. And so these guys figured, okay, if we can build a canal that links the Chicago River with the Des Plaines River, and thus the Mississippi, we can effectively link the Great Lakes with the Gulf of Mexico, making this the hottest trade spot anywhere in the United States, maybe even the world. Now, Marquette and Joliet did not live to see this dream come to fruition, but their idea lived on, and as Chicago continued to grow from trading outpost to town to city, we manifested the idea of the canal, we drew up designs, we started building, and eventually in 1848, we opened up the Illinois-Michigan Canal, and that is when Chicago's uh, career as a city really began properly. 1848 was a big year economically for us, not just with the opening of the canal, but with the opening of the Board of Trade, with the laying of the first railroad tracks in the city, and with the first steam engine to come right on through. Uh, the 1800s saw a lot of growth and development. We hit a little speed bump in 1871 with the Great Chicago Fire, some of you may have heard. 22 years later, we bounced back fully and properly. We felt confident enough to get ourselves a World's Fair, 1893, the Columbian Exposition, it was called. More on that a little bit later. And that was sort of our big comeback story. Chicago does love a good comeback story, if you think about it. The Chicago Cubs, Michael Jordan, the fire, many other things besides. And so that was kind of the moment when we really established ourselves as a 21st, as a 20th century metropolis. Now the 20th century itself is a little bit more roughshod. We had a couple of big wars that we fought in, as you may have heard. Uh, we invented deep dish pizza in 1929. That was a victory for us. In uh, 1933, we had another World's Fair called the Century of Progress. That one was run almost entirely by the mob and they made a lot of money off of that, so we don't talk about it nearly as much. And then Michael Jordan was on the Bulls, and that pretty much brings us to today, ladies and gentlemen. Unless you're a big baseball fan, in which case there's something about a curse and 108 years and a goat. But that is Chicago history in a very tight nutshell, as told by Elliot. You're all welcome. Let's get to the architecture, shall we? Frank Lloyd Wright, one of our better architects, uh, you may have heard of him, once said that he believed one day Chicago would be the last great beautiful city anywhere left in the world. Left anywhere in the world, excuse my bad grammar. And ego and civic pride aside, I think what he was talking about was how we have innovated and grown our architectural styles. Let's start off with my very favorite. We're starting, we're setting the bar very high here to start with. This is the St. Regis Chicago. They just finished it last year. As it stands, it is the third tallest building in the city, behind the Willis Tower and the Trump, but it is the tallest building in the world designed by a female-led architectural firm. The architect, her name is Jeannie Gang. If you don't remember anybody else from this tour, I humbly invite you to remember her. Jeannie Gang, she's doing some incredible work with architecture, as evidenced by the St. Regis here. The way that they achieved the sway and the flow of the building, um, Jeannie Gang, Geological contextualism. All right, yeah, sure. She works in a style called geological contextualism. Basically, she draws inspiration from ecological wonders or natural resources. So, something like the Saint Regis is, excuse me, is inspired by uh, shapes called frustums that naturally exist in sapphire formations. So, frustum, those who fail geometry, much like myself. 
A frustum is basically a cone with the top shaved off. Those of you who are actual geometry people, you know that this is just like a little bit of a condensed version. But essentially what Genie Gang managed to do was uh, create a concrete spine composed of frustums that were stacked right side up to upside down. So that creates an hourglass shape, all right? And then they just replicated that shape all the way up the floor, all the way up the tower's height. And that's what gives it that flow and that sway. I love that building. That is probably one of the best examples we have of contemporary architecture uh, in today's city. There's not really a name that we have for architecture that's really started to come up in the last 20 years. Um, probably within the next 20 years, somebody will come up with a name for it. But I think the things that you often note about contemporary architecture is that uh, the architects try to draw inspiration from natural resources, from ecological wonders. They try to bring people's awareness, not just to the local environment, but to the global environment as well. So you have a lot of buildings like the St. Regis of Chicago, which, use, which have low carbon footprints, which use a lot of recycled materials in their building, which use low emissivity glass, so that you still get natural light without getting a whole lot of ultraviolet in there. Uh, essentially, that's what I think we are building towards in terms of an architectural future. Chicago has always kind of been uh, a foundation for both United American and global architecture, and we're going to get to see uh, the way that timeline has played out over the last 120, uh, longer than that, 150 years. This year, actually, fun fact, this year will mark the 150th anniversary of the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. So. I imagine we'll celebrate with something big, maybe another big fire, who's to say? Let's talk about happier things, shall we? Dead ahead, we have a beautifully classic building, the Wrigley Building by name, named of course for the Wrigley Gum Company. Built in two parts, the Wrigley Building's southern half was built in 1921, the northern half in 1924. You can see that they are linked by the steel bridge in the middle there. The Wrigley Building is a style that's called Spanish Revivalism, all right? So in the early 20th century, Architects were taking their cues from European notions of design and beauty. When people thought about beauty, they weren't thinking about an American office tower, they were thinking about a Spanish cathedral or a French church or something along those lines. And so architects were in a big uh, hurry to beautify this city of ours because in the wake of the World's Fair of 1893, we realized we were gonna need to play catch up with a lot of other big global cities such as London, Paris, and the like. Um, Excuse me, the clock tower that sits at the top of the Wrigley is actually modeled after the Geralda Tower, which sits atop the Cathedral of St. Mary of the Sea in Sevilla, Spain, all right? So that's as direct a reference as we can get to true Spanish architecture from our friends across the Atlantic Ocean. Jumping ahead a little ways, as we come out onto the bridge, you're going to see a, another more contemporary style of architecture in the Trump International Hotel and Tower, built in 2009. Uh, contextualism is the name of the style of Trump Tower. Contextualism really took root in the United States in the 1980s and the 1990s. Contextualism, I think, is from where contemporary architecture springs from. Contextualism uh, is more based in bringing people's awareness to your immediate environment. So, something like Trump Tower is referencing both its neighbors on the river and the river itself. Don't believe me? I'll show you. We have the wide, handsome glass curtain wall in the front and the way it gracefully bends in around the edge there, you can see that. What it's doing is mimicking a bend in the Chicago River. Okay? Drawing your attention, albeit very subtly, to the natural resource right at its feet. You'll also notice the setbacks of the tower as it climbs higher. There's three of them total. Each of those setbacks corresponds to the height of a neighboring building. So the first setback is the same height as the roof line of the Wrigley building behind y'all. The second setback, same height as the Mather Tower, that skinny little building to y'all's left. And then that third setback is the same height as AMA Plaza, the Black Fox building directly next door. We call this visual continuity. Again, draw your attention very, very subtly to the buildings and the resources that you see around you without being a good neighbor. Speaking of Black Foxes, AMA Plaza next door, that is a building whose style is less concerned with being a good neighbor and more concerned with being a functionally beautiful building. AMA Plaza was built in 1973. It is a style that we in Chicago call black box modernism. It is sort of the height of the American modernist movement, which really picked up steam in the mid 20th century in these United States. The father of the American modernist movement, in, in, uh, the American modernist movement is then named Ludwig Mies Vandero, 
or just me's to his friends and also us. Uh, he came to Chicago in 1937, and that was really when he got the ball rolling on his whole uh, aesthetic philosophy. We'll see a lot more of his buildings on this tour. Uh, he designed over 45 buildings in downtown Chicago alone in his time. But jumping next door, uh, pointing out sort of the antithesis of a building of like Mies van der Roos, Marina City by name, the Corn Cob Towers, as they are uh, more colloquially called, but not be forgotten, this is the Midwest after all. The Corn Cob Towers were designed by a contemporary of Mies van der Roos, a man by the name of Bertrand Goldberg. Bertrand Goldberg built these in the 1960s when he realized that there was not a strong population base in downtown Chicago. And he wanted to change that. So Marina City is a pair of fully contained uh, residential towers. Everything that the citizens of Marina City need is no more than an elevator ride away. They have a grocery store in their towers, they have retail and convenience shops, they have a barber shop, they have a bowling alley, they have a swimming pool, everything they need right at their fingertips. Any of those amenities would have been really great to have in lockdown last year. I don't know about y'all, my building would be a town of Washington or higher in it. So, just, well, I, know, I need to move. I need to move. The rent is really cheap for that. So, free. What are you going to do? So, jumping ahead just a little ways, uh, I want to point out that wide, handsome red brick building that y'all see. Uh, getting a little ahead of myself here, but that's okay. That is the Reed Murdoch building. It's one of the grandfathers of the river, actually. It was built in 1914. It's one of the oldest warehouse buildings that still sits on the Chicago River. Um, you'll notice, oh boy, we got ourselves, we're on a collision course. Look out, people. Just kidding. It's going to be fine. Uh, so, the Reed Murdoch building, as I said, built in 1914. Uh, they were one of the first warehouse buildings to use the river as both a uh, commercial tool with boats coming up the river and dropping off supplies and shipments and goods. And they also used it as an aesthetic resource. You'll notice as we, oh, that's cool. You can just kind of dock right up and get yourself a stake. There you go. You'll notice as we pass by the Reed Murdoch, you have all the windows that line the front of the building uh, because the opposite, the people who designed the Reed Murdoch building wanted to use the river as essentially an aesthetic tool. They wanted people to have good views of the city. I think they knew that eventually the Chicago River would become a huge cultural attraction in our fair city. And in 1914, that wasn't the case. We were still heavily polluting this beautiful body of water of ours. We're doing a little bit better these days, but still, got a lot of work to do. You'll notice, actually, that on the left-hand side of the building, there are only five the windows, where on the right-hand, there are six. In 1926, they had to widen LaSalle Street here, so they had to chop off an entire section of the Breed Murdoch building to make way for LaSalle Street. That's called progress, people. That's how we do it. That was actually, uh, the expansion of LaSalle Street was outlined in an urban design plan for Chicago called the Burnham Plan, or the Plan of Chicago, which was written in 1909 by one of our best architects, a man by the name of Daniel Burnham. Those of you who have read Devil in the White City know what I'm talking about. Those of you who have not, Daniel Burnham was the chief architect of the campus fairground for the World's Fair of 1893. He was a big Chicago architect for a number of years before he actually got to design the fairgrounds. He's also thought to be the father of the American beautification effort, or the City Beautiful Movement, as it's sometimes called. Because in the wake of the World's Fair of 1893, when everybody saw the beautiful, pristine, white buildings on the campus, everyone took those ideas and went right back home to their towns and started telling their city's architects, hey, we want buildings like we saw in the World's Fair. Jumping ahead a little ways, uh, Merchandise Mart, built in 1930, or just the Mart, to you and I and the rest of the locals. The style is Art Deco, ladies and gentlemen. Art Deco took root in Chicago in the late 1920s. Uh, sort of a fusion of classical European design and American economic, uh, and American machines. And Art Deco, again, comes in the wake of World War I and the Industrial Revolution. So the idea is that you are pairing both uh, grandeur